um, it seems the number has been settled. So uh, I will start the uh, introduction of IMPC. But welcome again, everyone joining the IMPC Data API Workshop. Uh, my name is Sharon, and I'm a data wrangler working for the IMPC project. Um, there will be three speakers today. I will give an introduction of the IMPC project and an overview of our data flow process. Then databases are impressed as it relates to understand the data in the API. After my talk, Marina and Diego are going to talk about how to assess um, the data with exercises. Marina will talk about querying data using Solar API, and Diego will talk about how to use the Findodyne Solar Core to assess the IMPC disease association data. Um, there are some housekeeping rules before we start. Uh, please keep the cameras and microphones off during the talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to post in the chat anytime. Uh, for the first talk, we will answer the questions at the end of the talk. Um, for the last two talks and exercises, when Marina and Diego are speaking, there will be a member of our team answering your question on the chat. Uh, to know that your question is being answered, you will see an emoji that looks like a green tape under your message. It will take time for us to respond, so thank you for your patience. Um, now that's done, we will move on to the first talk on the IMPC introduction. IMPC has been funded since 2011, so the project has been running over 10 years. Uh, IMPC is short for International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium. It is a project that aims to knock out the protein coding gene in the mouse genome and carry out uh, comprehensive the phenotype, uh, the mouse mutant lines, in order to understand the function of the gene and how they could contribute to human disease. Um, it is also a collaborative project with different participants spread around the world with lots of centers and institutes particip participate in different parts of the project. The data handling center are located in the UK, which are Howell, uh, EBI in Cambridge and Queen Mary in London. And here are some numbers from the current release data release 21 that describe our data volume to understand the amount of data we collect. We have 12 phenotyping centers from which we collect data from. And we have over 8,000 genes and over 9,000 mutant lines with phenotyping data. Uh, there are fewer genes than lines because there are multiple mutants for a gene. Just looking into the line graph, uh, showing how many lines we collect over time. As shown in the graph, there is a continuous increase of lines we collect uh, from the 12 phenotyping centers since the first release until now. Um, so we're going back to the number uh, of these uh, mutant lines, there are over 95 million data points. Uh, almost 800,000 of images and 106,000 of phenotyping hits. Uh, phenotyping hits is, are when the mutant lines are identified as different compared to the control. We collect a lot of different types of data. The image shows example of different type of data collected through various procedure. You can see on the top right, uh, this is an example of the dysmorphology procedure where we collect the categorical data. At the bottom, you can see the measurements collect from the open field procedure displayed on an overtime graph. The orange dot shows the control data and the blue dot shows the mutant data. Uh, we also collect the images. Moving to the left hand side, the top shows the 2D images uh, from the X-ray procedure and the 3D images from the Marco CD micro CT procedure. Um, so we do collect a lot of different types of data for the IMPC project, and I will talk about how these large amount of data are collected and processed on this slide. Um, the data flow from, flow from data collection on the right uh, to the data being publicly available to the left bottom where the users are. So on the left, the centers perform phenotyping tests on the line. These uh, phenotyping data are uploaded by the center to the data coordination center. 
um, which is short for DCC, where we do validation and QC check, um, just to make sure the data is up to standard and retain its biological meaning. As we collect a large amount of different type of data, we have validation in place to check the incoming data. The validation also cross check with the resource databases, um, Genta and Impress, check if the incoming data are aligned with the information contains in this um, resource databases. I will explain further about uh, Impress later as it will be helpful to learn how the information relate to the Solar API. After the validation, we perform QC chat on the data at the DCC. The image showed a purpose-built uh, interactive platform where the DCC and the center communicate QC issues. The graph shows an example on how the data is displayed on this platform. The QC chat is done centrally at the DCC, and the center also has their own Q data QC process before the data come to us. After the QC check at the DCC, we export and move our QC confirmed data set to the core data archive, which is short for CDA, um, where they do the statistical analysis. After the analysis, um, the Queen Mary identif and identify human disease association. Um, at the end, the data will be released uh, and available at the public portal for the user where you could access the data through our website. We are doing um, data release regularly as there will be new data coming in between releases. As mentioned before, there are two uh, resource databases. One of them is Genta, which is a production tracking for the mutant lines. It is where we retrieve the line as well as the gene level information, such as marker symbol, allele symbol, and their MGI ID. You could search the data using this gene level uh, information through the API. Another database is called Impress, which I will explain later in the slide. Um, to understand the data at the Solar API, I will explain further what's in Impress and which you could assess through uh, this web link. Um, Impress is a resource database that could that contains information how and when the phenotyping procedure should be performed. There are hierarchy within the data structure on Impress, starting with pipeline. Uh, under pipeline, there are procedures, and under procedures, there are parameters, and under parameters, there are ontologies. Um, let's look at pipeline first. Um, the graph on the right shows the IMPC pipeline. Uh, pipeline determine what procedure are done, the order and the timing of those procedure. Um, you could find the center specific pipeline on the left hand side, and they could be slightly different from the IMPC pipeline. In addition to this, um, there are also pipelines under different ages, for example, uh, early adult, interval, and late adult. Um, when you click onto one of the procedure on the main impress page, it will bring you to that procedure, for example, grip strength. Each procedure has uh, SOP, uh, defines how a procedure should be performed and record what data should be collected. Um, you can search the data on the Solar API using the procedure name as well as the procedure stable ID. It is helpful to understand how the stable uh, procedure stable ID is constructed to search for data through the Solar API. So on this uh, procedure page, uh, grip strength, uh, procedure stable ID is next to the procedure name and it's IMPC GRS001. Uh, the first part IMPC is the pipeline identifier, the next GRS is the procedure, procedure identifier and the last 01 is the procedure version. Um, at the bottom of the procedure page on Impress, you can find parameters. Parameters define the attributes of the me measurement. On this slide, it shows some of the parameters from the group strength procedure. On the Solar API, you can search um, parameters data using the parameter name as well as the parameter stable ID. 
uh, if you look at the first uh, parameter falling grip strength measurements, the parameter stable ID has four parts, which is slightly different compared to the procedure stable ID. So you can find the pro uh, the pipeline identifier and PC GRS the procedure identifier O1 parameter number and O1 parameter version. Back to the whole image, we have different parameters uh, here. They have uh, they are in different types: serious, simple, procedure, metadata, um, and with the unit um, and data type defined. Uh, there are parameters that are marked for annotation, which means that they are going to be analyzed. The volume grid strength mean is one of the parameters in grip string procedure that is marked for annotation. It means that it will go through statistical tests and get analyzed. When the mutants are identified as different compared to the control, uh, an ontology term such as increased grip strength uh, will get assigned. These are the phenotype you see on the web portal. Um, but we usually use the mammalian ontology term ID to annotate the phenotype. Um, which you could find it on the ontology ID column. There are also other ontologies such as PATO term used in pathology procedure. Um, there are different ways that you could assess the data. Um, for non-programmatic um, data access, you could find the data through the gene page uh, or the FTP site. The image on this site, um, on this slide show how to assess data through the gene page. Once you are on our main website, our search engine will bring you to a gene page to fill data for an individual gene. Um, once you enter the gene page of your gene of interest, you will click onto one of the phenotype under the phenotype section that will bring you to the chart page on the right, um, on this. Um, uh, so it will bring you to the chart page and the chart page will show the data in more details. Um, the gene page also includes data related to human disease association, which show on the image here. Another way to assess the data is doing it programmatically. Here is uh, an, a help page for programmatic uh, data access, where you could find some example of API queries on how to assess our data. Um, so later, Marina and Diego are going to talk about how to build the API queries to assess our IMPC data with some practical exercises during and at the end of the talk. If you need and uh, if you need help with anything, please please go to our main website and click on to contact us uh, on the navigation bar. You could find a form at the bottom of the page which you could fill and send uh, your inquiries. Um, thanks for listening. Are there any questions? Um, if there is no question, I will pass on to Marina to talk about um, the Solar API. Thank you, Sharon. So uh, let me share my screen. So I suggest you can see my presentation. So hello, everyone. My name is Marina. I am data engineer at Embol EBI, and I'm going to give an introduction to querying solar and the use of the MPC solar APIs. So uh, let's begin. So we will have both theoretical and practical section. Uh, practical part includes seven exercises divided into four blocks, and we will use Jupyter Notebook to do exercises. So before we start, please uh, open the link that we sent into chat um, and try to log in using your email and password. So here is... Um, Sorry. Yeah, here is the link in chat. So 
to be able to do exercises, open it and log in by email and uh, password that we sent to you. So if, if you have any problems, let us know in the chat. So I'll wait a couple minutes. So if you encounter any problems, uh, your password or login is not working, please let us know in the chat. Uh, because we have a quite tight schedule, I'll continue. So what is an Apache Solar? Solar is an open source search pat platform that includes, includes different features, such as full text search, that allows to perform complex queries and facet search that uh, give users um, opportunity uh, to filter searches out based on different criteria or attributes. Uh, we use Solar to access MPC data for several reasons, because it quicks and uh, it allows to look for in large amounts of data and it provides precise search results even in complex data sets. So we have different solar cores uh, that provide access to IMPC data. Solar core is a specific collection of data. Each core has its own data structure and set of fields and now we have five available solar cores, IMPC images, experiment, statistical result, genotype, phenotype, and phenodyne core. Uh, you can find raw data in the experiment core. Uh, IMPC images core is for different IMPC images. Uh, after we process raw data, with a statistical pipeline, we'll get statistical results that goes into statistical result core. And then um, genotype phenotype core is generated. So here you can find significant data that was obtained from statistical result. And after that, phenotype core is uh, generated by using both statistical result and genotype phenotype core. So today we are going to focus on genotype phenotype core in the, in the exercises in this part. And then later uh, Diego will tell you more about phenotype core and uh, there will be a couple exercises also. So uh, we have documentation for solar course. You can follow this link and see the description of each field in the core and type of the field that is present in this core. Yeah. So we go next. Then how to make simplest request in browser. So here is the link that we can paste into browser. We have base URL that would be fixed if we want to access MPC data. After that, we have core name. In this particular example, this is statistical result core. And after slash, we have uh, the, the command. In this case, it is select. And after the command, we have two parameters. The first parameter is Q or query. Uh, we specify that we would like to get all the data from the statistical result core by putting asterisks, then colon, and then asterisk, which means that we would like to get all fields and all values. And we have the second parameter called rows, which allows us to get three rows from the whole data set. 
So in Solar, there are different commands, but select is the only available command for the MPC data. Let's paste this link into browser. So if we do this, we will get this page on the left and the output of this request will be JSON structured like this. So response header, you can see it here uh, in this, uh, in this part, you will find metadata like request status, query type and used parameters. And there is second part called response where you can find total number of documents matched, start of output relative to all documents here and list of document documents contents like here. So let's take a look closer to the list of documents. Um, so I have table here that represents the same data that you can see on the left. So for example, we have allele accession ID field here in the, in the JSON and we have value. So this value will be in the first row of the data set. And the same we have, for example, for data type, we have fields called data type and we have one value uh, and we can see this into the table. So one document could be converted into one row in the table. So let's go further. Um, instead of doing links manually, we wrote for you Python helper functions. We wrote those functions for exercises and you can use it after the workshop. So the first function is solar request. Uh, this is function that allows you to make simple solar request to access MPC data. We have two parameters. The first parameter is core. So we need to specify core name. In this example, it is statistical result. And also we have second parameter, uh, params. It is a dictionary of different solar parameters. So we have uh, parameters of Python functions and we have solar parameters. So we need to understand the difference between them. And uh, in this workshop, I'm going to focus on the parameters of solar requests. So here you can see two solar parameters Q, which stands for query and rows. So we request uh, all the data from statistical result core and we ask for three documents. So after we execute this function, you will get the output. The output is the generated URL. Uh, it's here. Uh, you can click on this and it will open in the browser. Then we have a total number of found documents. So for statistical result core, it is uh, around four millions. And after that, as an example, mm, we have this table uh, that is scrollable horizontally if it is very large. So here is the solar request function. Let's go next. Uh, sometimes we don't need all the fields that are present in the, in the core. And we would like to get only specific fields. Uh, so in this case, we will use FL or field list parameter to control which fields are returned. So uh, it's better to request limited list of fields because uh, in this case, 
it saves time and uh, uh, space on your disk. So in this example, we request uh, all the results from statistical result core, and we ask for um, marker symbol, top level and term name, effect size, and p value fields. And here is the result. But you need to be careful because if you misspell field, no error will be generated and this field will be silently omitted from the final result. So uh, you need to make sure that you type field name correctly. So let's go to the exercises. So uh, I'll go to the Jupyter Lab. I already logged in. So after you log in, you'll see this page. So here on the right, uh, you can see the Jupyter Notebook. And uh, let's go further. You have some introductory information. Uh, you also find um, useful links here. So let's start. First of all, we need to set up helper functions. So how, how can we do that? We need to execute cell below. So this is cell. It's uh, in a light gray background. So I click into the cell and you can see that the border color changed and the background became white. So I selected this cell. After that, I press play button above. So you can see panel here and I press play and the, the cell was executed. You can see that this number in square braces appeared. So one means that I uh, executed the cell first. So, okay, we can execute cells. Um, let's, let's see the solar request function and try to execute the example. Um, so let's run cell below and navigate the results. So we run solar request function uh, with a genotype, phenotype core and three parameters. I request uh, all, all the data, uh, 10 rows and uh, three, field, three fields, marker symbol, a little symbol and parameters table ID and and this function. So here is the result. Mm, I requested three rows, but got two rows. Um, let, let's try to understand what happened. Um, oh, I think I pronounced incorrectly this field name, uh, IDE instead of just ID. So I remove this. And I rerun the cell. And uh, here, three columns. It worked. Great. So let's go further. Uh, so you can see in the output your request, and you can click on it if you want. Uh, so, and you, so here you can see the result in browser, uh, but um, we don't need it now. So, the helper function provides the output in the convenient table view. So uh, this table will display it only 15 rows. And uh, so be careful. And let's get started with the exercises. Exercise block A. In this exercise, we are getting familiar with the gender phenotype core with significant results. 
So to, to know more about the score, um, request all um, request three rows and all fields from this score. Uh, let's say you would have uh, five minutes to do this exercise. So while you're doing exercises, I want to mention that those Jupyter notebooks won't work forever. Um, so it it will be around a week after the workshop when you can return to the exercises here. Uh, but after that, you will need to install and set up everything uh, on your computer locally. So it's a good chance to try out different functions and uh, to get more familiar with solar. And please ask ask questions in the chat if you have any problems or um, any questions, um, ask us in the chat, uh, me or my colleagues are pleased to answer to your questions. So 
so yeah, five minutes uh, are finished. So to do this exercise, you need to specify genotype, phenotype, core for the first argument. Or, and in this exercise, you would like to get um, all, all fields and three rows. So I put here three and here for the query parameter asterisk colon asterisk. Uh, and then execute this cell and here the result. So the next exercise is to select specific fields. Um, so as you can see here, we have a lot of fields in genotype phenotype core. So let's choose um, the following ones. Marker symbol, marker accession ID, diagnosis, parameter name, parameter stable ID, and p value. So you can modify query from exercise one and request those fields. So you'll have um, five minutes to do this exercise and uh, so let's start. So let's do this exercise together. 
as um, so we need to request uh, all the data from gender phenotype or um, we need we need um, three fields uh, three rows and after that we need to type um, list of all fields, so marker um, symbol, marker exception ID, city parameter name, parameter stable ID, and e value so here is the result uh let's continue our our theoretical part so for querying specific fields we can use query parameter um and we can specify field and value in this parameter. For example, to get the gene of the, the symbol GPRC6A using the marker symbol field, you can um, put this into query parameter um, and get the result. So if you want to search in right range of values, you can use this syntax and asterisk may be used for either or both endpoints to specify an open end range query. To find all field values less than or equal to 100, you can use um, this syntax. Find all fields values greater than or equal to 100, you can use here. Uh, so you can um, type 100 then two and then asterisk and if you want to find any document with the value between uh, the effective values of minus infinity and plus infinity uh, just uh, use two asterisk into both ends so in this example here we request values with a P value from zero to ten to the minus four and request limited columns. So here is the result. We can combine different parameters together using logical operators. We can match both conditions by specifying filter one and filter two. Uh, or we can match any one of the conditions uh, by specifying uh, filter one or filter two. So in this example here, we request marker symbol GPRC6A and p value from zero to 10 to minus four. And we have three documents in the output. So let's continue with the exercises and start exercises from block B. So in the exercise three, you need to filter by single field. So we'll focus on uh, DTLK1 and you need to filter the results using, using marker symbol fields and this particular value. So modify query from exercise two and get the result. So the total number of documents will be 13. So let's say you will have, you will have three minutes for this exercise.
Mm, oh, I can see a question in the chat. So if exercise was not successful, so the first exercise, if if it didn't work, so in this case, the second exercise will also fail. So um, we can help you with this um, just uh, which which error would you encounter? Please specify in the chat, and we we can address it. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, tell you again, if the first exercise um, from block A haven't worked, but you put every uh, core and parameter the same, but it hasn't worked for some reasons, uh, make sure that you run this cell with helper functions. So before doing any exercises, uh, run helper function, and then um, uh, this exercise uh, should work. Hmm. So I can see the error. Um, so let's go back. Um, you see, you need to use uh, quotes. It could be single quotes or double quotes. But uh, generally, it's better to use single quotes and you understand why in the next section with Pentagon Core. So, so yeah, thank you. Even uh, you need to put quotes into query. So you need to put quotes uh, before, uh, before asterisk and before the first asterisk and before the second. Uh, and after that, uh, it should work. And let's go to the exercise three. So for exercise three, uh, we would like to get data for a particular gene symbol. So then let's specify that we need interested in uh, marker symbol dclk1 and uh, we need three rows as it was in the previous example and uh, run the cell and here is the result the total number of documents is 13. so the next exercise is about combining different, combining multiple filters. So uh, in addition to marker symbol filter from the previous exercise, you let's also apply more strict p-value threshold. So uh, that is less than 10 to minus four and request 10 rows instead of three rows. And uh, let's say you have uh, five minutes to do this exercise.
So if you need slides to do exercises, you can find them into the uh, NPC Data API Workshop repository in the presentation folder. So, um, or you can look at the cheat sheet where you can find examples of different queries that will help you to do the exercises. Um, yes, something wrong with the preview. So, I put link into the chat. So let's continue. We have exercise four, and um, we need to modify query from exercise three uh, to do this. So here we have this query, markers, marker symbol DCLK1. I put it here. And we need another p value threshold. So first, I Type end, and we need a uh, p value threshold. Uh, so I type p underscore value because we use underscore in the name of fields. And then I specify asterisk, then uh, minus four. And we need to specify 10 rows, so I change it to 10. And then execute the cell and have this result. So let's say we interested in MPC GRC uh, 010001. So for exercise five, Let's use this parameters table ID. So in the exercise five, 
you need to search for parameter stability in the impress and answer uh, the questions. So uh, navigate to the impress website first. So you can click to this link to navigate this site. And then you need to search for the parameter stability IPC GRC. So you can see it here. So let, let's make this exercise together. In the interest of time, we have a quite tight schedule. So I copy this parameter stable ID and go to the Impress website. I paste it in the search field here and look for this parameter stable ID. So then uh, we need to examine the procedure associated with the pipeline key IPC uh, 001. So let's do this. We interested in pipeline key IPC 001. And then let's view this procedure. So we have this impress page about this procedure. And the, we need to answer the question, which week was the specimen tested for this procedure? So let's look what we have here. Uh, we have purpose where you can find some description. And then we have experimental design where we can find this information. It's week nine. And this is an answer to the question from here. The specimen is tested on week nine. Uh, beyond that, you, we have equipment, procedures, step by step. Uh, we have notes, uh, in, and also we have parameters and metadata, metadata sec section where mm -hmm. we can see this uh, IPC GRC, um, uh, the different parameter stable IDs. So here we've done this exercise. Let's come back. So to exclude data, we can use logical filter uh, that can we can use logical filter not. And for example, we would like to exclude GPRC6A and we use this syntax. So we put not operator in the beginning and after that we put field name colon and value that we would like to exclude so a useful tip when combining different filters it's better to use parentheses to make sure that operators are applied as you intended to for example here uh, in the first parentheses we use uh, field one colon value a or field one colon value b after that we have another parentheses with not operator and field two colon value and those two combines with end boolean operator so sometimes for different p fields it is possible to encounter no values when we work in, in Python, in, uh, for example, NumPy or Pandas, they are represented as uh, none in tables, not a number. A null value means that there is no data in this field for a given document, or that for this document, this field is not defined or not used. So you can filter out null values by applying the range filter that we've seen before. So field, colon, um, so square parentheses, um, asterisk to asterisk. So here we can exclude no p-values in this example. Uh, one thing that I want to mention is that you need to query responsibly. Do not request all the data if you don't need anything. Optimize query performance by requesting only necessary 
data to minimize data transfer and processing overhead. Use filters, combine different filters together, and include only re relevant fields. So during the construction of query, first request small data on three or five documents to make sure it works correctly, correctly, and then request all data that you need. And use pagination to avoid overwhelming the system with large data requests. So uh, what is pagination and how to use this? Pagination is download is getting data page by page, not everything at once. So if you want to request all the data from one core, do not execute solo request function without rows parameter or without anything. So uh, if you run this query with Q asterisk, colon asterisk, so anything from anything, um, you will get only 10 rows because this is a default value. So instead of solo request, use patch request function to download the data. It retrieves results in several chunks and to indicate patch um, to indicate chunk size, you can specify batch size parameter. Uh, and in this example is 1000. So after executing batch request function, um, you can download the data in the format of preferences. You can download it as a JSON or CSV. To save data frame as JSON, you can use uh, this syntax. So the F is a data frame, so to JSON, and it will save this data frame as example, data frame.json. Uh, you can also save CSV, but note that the fine structure such as list and nested data will be lost. So um, uh, it's better to save JSON and use JSON instead of CSV. So uh, we have exercises from block C, uh, but I just demonstrate how it works. So uh, in the block C, we need to download data in chunks. So we use batch request function. So first of all, we need to define this function by executing this cell. Uh, after that, um, we have an example of query for cardiovascular system. So in the example below, we request cardiovascular system phenotype, uh, effect sites that is not null, and uh, uh, we specify life stage, uh, late adult. And uh, here is the query. We haven't downloaded anything yet. We just look at the query and we can see, you can see the total number of documents 413. And then uh, we need to download the data using batch request function and set batch size parameter to 100. So let's start from uh, putting here uh, 100 as a batch size. And we need to use query from the previous uh, cell. So we need those two parameters, Q and FL. Q is query, FL is field list. So I put it here. And after that, I run this function batch request. So it retrieved all the data and uh, store as data frame. So to save this, I can execute um, this. I can execute this cell. So it will save data frame as a JSON and it would be named as IPC data.json and it appeared here in this left panel. And also I can save it as CSV. And it also appeared here. So 
let's continue. Next uh, advanced thing is faceting. So in solar faceting is a feature uh, that allows to categorize results into different groups based on specified criteria. To make a faceting query, execute facet request function to estimate count types of the categories. So here is facet request function. Uh, so required parameters is rows. Uh, we need to specify it uh, as zero, facet on, and facet field, uh, field name. So uh, we have also another parameters, facet limit that specifies the maximum number of facets for a field that should be returned. Um, it's better to specify it. Uh, and also there is a facet min count that specifies the minimum counts required for a facet field to be included in the response. So uh, here is the facet request function. So we use statistical result core and specify parameters. We would like to look at all the data uh, and then we specify required parameters, rows zero, facet on, facet and facet field uh, zygosity in this example, facet limit 15 and facet min count equals to one. And here is the result. So for zygosity, we have four categories, homozygote, heterozygote, hemozygote, and wild type. And we have counts per each category here. So now exercise from block D. So it is a faceting query. So you need to use this facet request function. And to use it, we need to run this cell first. After that, uh, we need to make an exercise. So uh, in this example, we will be querying against whole JDF and type core. And we want to count how many documents there are for each value of the zygosity fields. Uh, so modify this query. And let's say you have um, five minutes to do this exercise.
so five minutes um, are over so you need just specify facet field for this uh, exercise and in this in this exercise we need to specify the gaussity here using single quotes um, and run the cell so um, total um, number of counts for homozygote is uh, 52,606 uh, as we should get. Let's continue that presentation. Uh, so it was the last exercise. Uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, I would like to say a couple points. So Solar is an API for accessing IPC data. It consists of multiple cores, which contain different data types. You can request specific fields and filter results are according to combination of conditions. So to make uh, requests, um, please use wrapper function because it makes life so much easier. We don't need to construct uh, request manually and query responsibly. Only request what you need and use pagination. So this is the end. Thank you, everyone. The next speaker will be Diego. So I stop sharing my screen. Can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so before I begin, if you have any questions about any of the two sections that we've, you know, we've gone over, uh, please do type them in, in the chat. Um, for now, I, I will proceed. I'll introduce myself. My name is Diego. I'm a bioinformatician from Queen Mary University. We work together with the IMPC. And now I will cover the final part of this workshop, which is the disease section and disease association section of the website. Um, I will explain specifically what uh, within the Thenodyne core. Uh, I will split this talk into two. The first part will be more of the conceptual side. Um, what is the Phenodyne core? What kind of information we can find there? Where does that data come from? And the second part will be uh, some practical exercises. Well, well, you will have the opportunity to practice some of the concepts that you've learned so far, um, but also I'll introduce some new skills that are translatable between not only this core, but also the other cores uh, that Marina spoke about. Great. So. Um, so far, we spoke a lot about some of the mouse information. Now we'll speak about the human mouse matching uh, and how that's useful for us as researchers. So all of the data analysis that Sharon spoke about uh, generates a lot of data and that data we can later use uh, to predict which human diseases are associated with specific genes. And uh, the idea of doing this is to find novel disease models that researchers can then use to investigate diseases or maybe do some gene discovery. So if you go onto the website, IMPC website, and you look for a specific gene, let me just use my laser. If you look for a specific gene, for example, you will be presented with this screen. And if you scroll down to the disease section, you will see this panel where you will see on the left, some of the diseases that are associated with that specific gene. And then on the right, some of the phenotypes uh, for which a model has been matched to a disease. Um, all of this is possible. Uh, because of this tiny score that you see in the middle called the phenodyme score. Um, and this score comes from the phenodyme algorithm. So what is phenodyme? Um, phenodyme stands for phenotype comparisons for disease genes and models. This is a quantitative measure that can tell us how well a mouse model recapitulates the clinical features of a disease. And these clinical features often come in the form of ontologies. So we're able to encapsulate those clinical terms into computationally organizable entities. That is, for example, the mammalian phenotype ontology and the human phenotype ontology. So we can get, for example, a disease, get all the HPO terms from it, 
and then align them with the MP terms from the mice. And when we do that, we can create a percentage similarity score that goes from zero to 100 and tells us how similar they can be. This is a graphical interpretation of, of how that goes. So at the top, you'll see the phenotyping pipeline. Perhaps we have a mouse knockout. It undergoes some standardized phenotyping and then that mice uh, get some MP annotations. We then use that information and pass it to Phenodyme where we can uh, probably suggest some novel disease models that can be used to study a disease, or maybe they can serve as a gene uh, for gene discovery. So a graphical example below here would be, let's say that for this specific mice, we obtain an annotation that was hepatic steatosis. Then we can map it to the equivalent in the HPO ontology, which is hepatic steatosis in humans. We can produce a phenotype score, and then potentially we can say, this might be a very good model to study fatty liver disease. Where does the data to produce that come from? Um, the disease data comes mainly from OMIM and Orphanet. And then uh, we obtain the mouse models that contain MP annotations, and we map them to the HPO terms from those diseases. Then we can pass it to the algorithm, and we can decide, OK, there is a match. Maybe there is not a match. If you go back to the website, there is one distinction that I would like to make. When you look at this, uh, these two tabs in the website, on the website, on the left, you will see this tab saying human diseases associated with the gene that you queried. Um, these are genes that have been uh, curated by either OMIM or Orphanet, um, and they have been established to be associated with a specific gene. The ones on the right uh, do not have such association, but they've been uh, associated due to the phenotypic similarity. So later on in the exercises, I will show you how we can see that on the core and how can we, we can filter over it. If you're interested in more about these phenotype scores, um, my supervisor, Pilar Pichero, recently curated a portal uh, that you can access here on this link, but that's also available on the Jupyter notebooks that you're using, um, where you have a very nice dashboard of all the associations from the most current for the previous release uh, with the phenotype scores that correspond to them. Now, how do we interpret the phenotype score? This is an example uh, where we have on the left a disease, let's say mitochondrial complex for deficiency, and it was matched with this specific mouse model. The phenotype score in this case was 37, uh, which if you think from zero to 100 might be a bit low, uh, but the fact is that it, it isn't. The mean phenotype score for the last release was around 32. So we considered this to be a, a, actually a, a nice score, a very good score. What you're looking at here is the phenotypes on the left are the phenotypes that correspond to the disease and the phenotypes on the right correspond to the model. And the boxes in gray are the one, the phenotypes that were matched to each other and the whites are the one that did not match. So in this case, um, we have three phenotypes that were matched uh, from the disease to the model, but we have numerous other phenotypes from the nervous, skeletal, musculature and other systems that were not matched. So as we had many phenotypes from the disease that did not match to the mouse, then the score goes down um, a little bit. Let's see the case for a higher score. For example, in this case, we have another association where the score was 59. In this case, the disease only has three phenotypes. Out of two were matched, um, out of two out of three were matched to the, to the specific mouse model. So uh, because most of the phenotypes were matched, um, that score goes um, high. And finally, we have a very high score where the disease has very few phenotypes, but both of them have been recapitulated within the mouse model. So we get a quite a, quite a high score of 96. So just bear in mind, whenever you see this phenotype score, um, think about the number of phenotypes that maybe are um, encompassed within that association, uh, and then you can interpret the, those um, quite nicely. Right. So now I will speak about the phenotype core itself, uh, how we can query it, what information we can find in it, and finally we'll be able to calculate the phenotype score. So as I go along with these exercises uh, and these examples, I will also give you some tips uh, that you can implement to make the writing of your queries um, a bit easier. Right, so within the phenotype core, I'll introduce a new type of information called a type. Types are essentially categories or subsets of information within that core. So that means that all of these types on the left are just different categories of information between inside the phenotype core. 
Today, we will only look at the disease model summary type, um, which I believe is the one that's most useful uh, to extract the information that we're interested in. Um, but by all means, if you're interested in these, please do go in and do some of the uh, searching in your own time. Uh, so this is how a query for the phenotype core would look like. We will stay with our helper function that Marina introduced in the previous session. And in this case, we will pass the keyword uh, phenotype to the core. This is the name of the, of the core. So bear in mind, lowercase p, um, just a, a single word. And then when we pass our parameters, perhaps this is the greatest distinction versus the other core, is every time we write a query parameter for our phenotype core, we need to pass this type, colon, and then the type that we want to look for. In this case, this disease model summary. So this would be type, colon, disease model summary. Uh, we need this for every query that we're going to create in the um, phenotype course. So do bear in mind, this is quite important. The second tip that I will give you to use the tools that we have provided for working with this API is the use of single quotes. So uh, notice that I've used single quotes to encapsulate that query. Um, and this will become more important as we start to input other fields or other uh, other filters uh, where we will use uh, double quotes. So whenever we try to mix some of these, um, Python's not really happy, we can get some errors. So to try to stay safe and query the best way possible, we shall stay with the single quotes. Now, when we execute this query, we will present it with this table down below. These are the fields that are returned. And the JSON or browser representation would look something like this. Apologies for the small uh, font. We will see them more clearly when we do the exercises. But as you can see, we also have many, many fields. So whenever we query the phenotype core, um, we should get a good overview of what fields we want, which brings me to which fields are available in this core. Um, as you can see, there are plenty of them. We won't go over each one of them uh, individually. Uh, if you want to, the link to the documentation for the specific phenotype core is down below, but it's also on your Jupyter notebooks and we'll see it shortly. And for now, I would like to bring your attention to these ones. I think these are the fields or filters that we will use the most to get the information we need. So for example, we might need to pass some disease identifiers for mom or orphanet. We might need a disease term, so the name of a disease. Uh, we might be interested in a specific model. So if we have the MGI identifier for that model, we can pass it. If we want to know where that model came from, it was MGI or MPC, uh, we have a field for that. Um, then this is quite important. The marker ID refers to the mouse gene ID. Uh, so these identifiers from MGI are also quite, quite important. Uh, whenever you see this marker ID, bear in mind, this is for the mouse genes. And we also have that uh, marker symbol, so the name for that uh, MGI identifier. Now, with those filters in mind, we can start to build some queries, but we can also build on the previous exercises that Marina showed. So in this first example that I've given you here, we are using the Boolean operators that Marina showed us where we can uh, join different conditions together to try and fetch a, a plethora of results. So in this case, I am interested in querying the phenotype core. I am interested in the disease model summary type, and I want to get um, all of the models or all the information for which there was only models of the IMPC. So I pass model source to IMPC and I'm interested in a specific mouse gene, uh, this MGI1929872. One thing I want to highlight is that one good idea of using these marker IDs and these MGI identifiers is that they're more stable than your uh, marker symbols or names because name, the names can change over time or a single gene can have many different names. So if you want to make sure you're querying uh, consistently, I do recommend you use these MGI identifiers. Um, we'll come back to these uh, fields shortly, but for now, uh, please do go to the exercises one to three in the phenotype section, uh, which we will go over together. So um, a couple of tips. If you've been scrolling around and you want to get to the phenotype section, once you're here on your uh, Jupyter notebook, you can see on the sidebar, you have this nice three bars on the, on the left at the table of contents, and you will be able to see uh, the different titles of the different sections. So you can navigate everything more quickly. So in this case, if you want to get to Phenodyme Core, you can navigate here and it'll bring you down there. 
Uh, now, in this section, I've included some of the links that might be of interest to you after this talk. So these first two, the IPC disease model summary and disease associations, just contain an overall uh, general information of the concepts I spoke about phenotype and how those scores are calculated. There's the link to the disease portals, uh, disease model portals, some links for to OMI and Orphanet if you want to look for identifiers for specific diseases, and the phenotype core documentation. So let's start with the first exercise. Um, the idea of this exercise is just to get familiar with the core. Uh, we have to write a query where we retrieve five rows of the phenotype core uh, and remember to pass the type disease model summary. If you complete this successfully, you should get around 8 million uh, documents of data. And uh, just as a guidance, just you know that you should replace only the data that has uh, three dots um, in there. So should we say around two minutes to do this exercise? Um, and then we'll continue with the next exercises. Uh, we have a question in the chat of the different possibilities of the models excluding the IMPC. Uh, let me look for a list, but off the top of my head, I think we can get MGI, uh, 3i, um, and there must be a couple more. Right, so that should be around uh, two minutes. Uh, so we will look for the sake of time, I will show you the answer just here below instead of typing it. So if you did this correctly, your query should look something like, like this. Uh, on the core field, you should get single quotes, uh, phenodyme, no spaces. And then for the parameters, uh, you should pass the type, colon, disease model summary, all together in single quotes. Uh, and in this case, we're only querying for five rows. So if you execute this, um, you should be presented with something like this. And if you go into the browser, um, you can see all of the different fields that are available. Uh, these can get quite long because of these disease match phenotypes. So you have lists of the phenotypes that were matched. These can get quite long. Um, so if you want to explore that, it's worth exploring um, on your own time. Now let's go to exercise two. For this exercise, uh, we want to filter by disease. So when we want to filter by a specific disease, we have two options of fields. We can either choose the disease term or the disease ID. Um, so for this question, I would like you to go and, and click on the documentation, which we have linked over here, uh, and try and read for the description for these two terms and see which of the two is more appropriate if you want to look for uh, Robinow syndrome, which is the disease of interest. Um, so the question for this, although the spoiler is here, is how many documents or rows are um, 
available in Ruby Nose Hinder. So uh, again, let's try and do two minutes for this specific query. You only have to fill out the query parameter and then we'll go over the answer. That should be around two minutes. Uh, so let's go over the uh, solution. So if we go to the documentation, which I've clicked here, and if we go to disease ID, the description is a unique identifier for the associated disease. So perhaps we're not looking for an identifier, we're looking more for a name. So if we go down to disease term, uh, we can see that this specifies the term or name of a disease. So possibly this is the one we need. Uh, so if we go back to our exercise, Again, I will show you the solution. Uh, we include this type disease model summary. We use our AND operator to change the, chain the different filters. We include the disease term, which we got from the documentation, and we can type Robino syndrome. Again, you can pass as many uh, rows as we want. In this case, we want only five. So if we execute this, uh, we get this nice uh, return. Um, I will show you one nice trick. If you're interested, let's say, in different keywords, so for example, if you're interested in many diseases that have the word syndrome in it, you can do uh, these wildcard um, asterisks, uh, and you can look for the word syndrome, for example. So if you type this in, again, into disease term, and use these wildcards around the word syndrome, uh, when you run it, you will get many more results, of course, uh, but you will get a lot of the terms that include the word uh, syndrome within it. So if you're interested in something general like syndrome or perhaps the word diabetes, uh, this is a great tool that you can use to get many results related to a specific word. So remember these uh, wildcards can come quite handy when you're looking for, for things like this. Um, let's go to exercise three, where the idea is to uh, filter by uh, to, to retrieve all the mouse model information related to a specific disease. So let's say we want to retrieve the first five rows that are from the mouse models that are associated with Robinow syndrome. So we will continue with the query above. So if you had any issues with uh, executing the uh, query with Robinow syndrome, please do put it in the chat and we will be able to help you. 
because we need that to progress. Otherwise, um, here's the solution for the previous one. So you can cut and paste it. And now all we would need is to pass the different fields that we've specified here uh, into your field section over here. So you can get uh, the information per model that's available. So while you cut and paste, let's say around two minutes again, Okay, that should be around two minutes and hopefully this one wasn't too difficult um, and it was helpful for you to uh, practice some of the skills that you acquired before. Um, so the solution for this is just to pass these fields um, into our field parameters. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, if you by accident uh, make a mistake, a spelling mistake on one of the columns, um, it does not let you know there's not an error, but all that happens is that that column disappears. So make sure you double check your, your spelling when you do these queries. And uh, if you have, uh, let's say in this case, I know that I have seven fields. So when I look at my output, I have to make sure that I am counting around seven fields or columns in this case. All right. Let's go back to the presentation for the final stage of uh, the workshop. Um, so in this next section, I think you can relax a little bit. Uh, I will show you some of the um, tools that we have available in Solar, and I will demonstrate some of these within the Finadime core. Um, so hopefully you'll take uh, away some of the uh, very powerful queries that you can create um, using these tools uh, and using the IMPC website, API, sorry. So uh, from all our fields, from our, our fields of interest, um, I would like to highlight these two. These are just two uh, numerical values with which we will we'll uh, we'll call average, normal, and maximum normalized. Um, it's not really relevant for the workshop to know what these are, uh, but just know that there are two values that we need to calculate the phenotype score that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I will use these to show you some skills that we can uh, incorporate into writing more powerful queries. So one of the things that Solar allows us to do when we query is to create, generate some calculations with the functions that are built in Solar. Um, so for example, I have this query that builds on the previous one before we went into the exercises where I retrieved uh, the models that belong only to IMPC for a specific mouse gene. I put out the pointer. Um, and then I have um, elevated my query by passing the fields uh, disease ID and model ID. And after that, I want to calculate the value um, that is the maximum value that we saw minus the average value that we just saw. 
Um, so because these queries start to get a bit lengthy, I often use these backslashes uh, within the queries. This allows me to create a new line and it's visibly easier for me to create my queries. So if they start to get a bit cluttered, um, this is one useful tip that you can include in your queries. So to build my calculation, I first write a field name. In this case, it is max average uh, difference, um, which I establish here. And then I use a colon, and then I pass the formula that I want to use. So Solar allows me to do the subtraction between two fields using the sub function. Um, so whatever I pass in the parentheses of that sub function, um, they will be subtracted from one another. Um, so once I pass this into the fields um, parameter, this is the result I get. So I get my disease field, which was established here, my model ID, which was which was established here, and then the calculation I created on the fly. So this can be quite powerful um, if you want to calculate something uh, on the fly with solar. Now, what if I want to sort those values uh, from highest to lowest or lowest to highest? Um, solar also allows us to do sorting. And we can do this with fields that already exist, but also with fields that we are calculating on the fly. So I've created a somewhat complicated example here on the slide. Don't worry if you don't understand it fully. Again, this is only for you to get an idea of what we can do with solar. Um, so this elevates the query. We have the same query here, uh, the same fields, and now I've included the sort parameter. And the syntax for the sort parameter is we pass sort, a specific field, and when we tell it if we wanted to have our results in ascending or descending manner. Um, an example with that, of that would be, let's say we want to sort by disease terms. So we sort uh, by a specific disease term in descending um, manner. In my example, I wanted to sort by the value I calculated. So I passed to the sort parameter the formula that I used to calculate this max average difference. So um, this is a bit cluttered, but don't worry. All I did was I copied and pasted that sub parenthesis uh, chunk of code, and then I told it I wanted in ascending manner. So here I have all of the results of that difference between those two values, uh, which will be useful, for example, to calculate the phenotype score. And to further reinforce some of the skills that we saw before, um, I included in my query two other parameters where I excluded the null values. So if you remember from Marina's talk, she told us a bit how to exclude the null values or the non values. Uh, I use that here as well to avoid um, too much data that wasn't necessary. So do you remember that you have these tools available and um, you have them available on the notes as well? Now, again, um, it's time to calculate the phenotype score because I spoke about it uh, too much already. So again, we use these two values and all we need to do is to get the average between those two. Um, so the max normalized value and the average normalized value, and we get the average of those two. And we'll do that in the next set of exercises, uh, which I will demonstrate for the sake of time. So don't worry, uh, just um, pay attention and I will guide you through the next exercises. So we have our phenotype score um, calculation and we want to calculate the phenotype score. We want to sort the results by this specific score and we want to get only the results that um, have a gene disease curation attributed to them. So if you remember earlier from the talk on the website, there was two tabs, one that had OMIM and orphanet curated diseases, but the other one didn't. So we want to keep only those ones that were curated. Um, so we want to retrieve all the diseases that are related to this gene, NXN. Uh, we want to use these fields. Um, and then to keep that OMIM association, we want to pass a specific filter, a field that is association created uh, and set it to true. Um, and all of that happens here in this field, except for the field. So we create our type disease model summary. We specify the marker ID, which is up here. And then we tell it, okay, I want to keep only the those associations that have been curated and that becomes true. Then I pass all of these fields down here. And then I use the backslash just to show you where the phenotype score is calculated. So I create a new field called the phenotype score, and I use this somewhat ugly method to calculate an average, which is uh, sum the two values and then divide them uh, by two. And then I use the sorting parameter to of that formula to get them in descending order. So once I run that, I end up with this output, and we can see that for this specific uh, disease, 
we get a maximum value of 49.73 and 49.2, um, which you will be able to see on the website if you look for this gene later on. Um, so then again, if you want to use this, uh, bear in mind of the different techniques uh, that we can use to this. One final example I want to uh, give to you, and this is quite useful if you're interested or if you have a list of genes or models, is um, and you want to use the API to download information on each of them, we've created a set of helper functions to do that. Um, so for now, we have this very large chunk of code that I will execute. You don't need to be concerned of what's in it. Uh, just know that if you want to do what I'm about to do, you need to execute this first. And then here is an example where we have, uh, let's say, a list of models, or it could be a list of genes uh, that's encompassed here within the square brackets. And we have our new helper function, which is the iterator solar request function. It works very similar to the helper function that you've used already, but it has a couple of new parameters that I will explain. So the first one is um, field list. So uh, because I want to get information on multiple um, model IDs, I need to tell the function, OK, I have stored that list of items I want to look for in a list called models. So that goes up here. And then I pass this name over here. And then I tell it to the, to the, to the function, I want to query by the field that whose name is model ID. So I tell it, whenever you do this query, look for model IDs. And I pass that to field type. Um, once that's done, um, because I'm going to be downloading this data, I just tell it I want it to be named model IDs and I want it in JSON format. So once we run this function, it takes a little bit, but it prints the URL twice because it's doing it in batches since we're trying to query responsibly and it creates this new model uh, IDs JSON file. You can find that file up here on your file browser on your Jupyter notebook. It should be right here. And if you want to see it, you can double click it see the JSON structure here. Um, if you want to download it, you can right click uh, download and it should give you um, plenty of information you can work with. You can also uh, download this data on CSV format, which is available only for this function. Um, so please uh, bear in mind that this resource is available for you. Now I have left here a bonus exercise um, where you can apply this last concept of downloading a series of genes um, to other cores, because the nice thing about this is that the tools that we've created are operable between the other cores. So um, if you want to look for a list of genes, for example, from the genotype phenotype core, um, this exercise will be good practice for you. So I encourage you to try it uh, on your own time, because I think we're running short right now. Um, and if in doubt, the uh, exercise, the answers um, notebook is available on the GitHub. So with that, I will leave you with a couple of final remarks. The first one is, remember that the repository uh, link is up here. So if you go to the top of your Jupyter Notebook, workshop repository is here. So make sure you go click that and save that, um, that link. And finally, let's go back to the slides. Um, and again, a reminder that this Jupyter Notebook that you're using is only available for a week. So after a week, this will be gone. You will need to access the information from our Git repository. So if you want to keep track of that, again, um, please use that link or the link I just showed you on the Git Jupyter Notebook. It has been sent on the chat, but also on email. And finally, if you want to get help or if you want to get uh, in touch with us, um, go onto the website and you'll find this contact us button right here. We can raise a ticket with your questions. Um, I think that's it for me. So thank you very much. And any questions are very welcome in the chat.
So I have a question in the chat uh, that says, do we need any API keys or token to start using APIs from applications? Uh, do we have any insight on that? No, uh, you can use, they are uh, open and you can use them as we have used them today. So you can, uh, yeah, hit our endpoints. They do have um, a limited amount of RAM memory and processing power. So I wouldn't use them on a production setup, but you can definitely use them to access our data and, and reuse our data in other applications. Thank you, Federico. Hope that answers the question.